My name is Uta Poiger and I'm the Interim Dean of the College of Social Sciences and Humanities here at Northeastern. Um, as you can imagine, usually my college does not um, organize uh, larger events or collaborate with the law school and with the Office of Student Affairs to bring larger communities together during finals week. We indeed have been through quite a momentous um, period here in Boston and at Northeastern. The Boston Marathon bombing and its aftermath have shaken all of us. The bombing, as you know, affected members of the Northeastern community directly. Some members suffered injuries, others were first responders. And our thoughts are very much with the families of the four victims who were killed, and also with all of those who were injured and traumatized by these events. Our event tonight is an effort at early analysis, an effort to discuss the many issues that the Boston Marathon bombing and its aftermath have raised, from questions of motivations for crime, to the importance of resilience, to the prosecution of domestic terror suspects, to the dangers of misreading religious motivations, and the role of social media. As chair of the organizing committee for our year-long series on conflict, civility, respect, peace, Northeastern Reflects, it seemed to me important to have a serious discussion on our campus. And when I started to send some emails around on Sunday, I have to say that many others, including the senior leadership of Northeastern, immediately agreed. Let me thank in particular the university events team, Erica Cost, Leslie Casey, and others from the College of Social Sciences for helping pull today's event together. And I am delighted that we have today a panel of analysts and a moderator who have helped audiences in the national and international media comprehend the questions that the events of last week have raised. They have experience in the legal, policy, and law enforcement fields, as well as in sociological analysis. Coming together to understand horrific events is one of the ways in which we can move forward the goal of our conflict and civility series namely fostering civic sustainability on campus and beyond. This evening is the result of a collaboration between the College of Social Sciences, the School of Law, and Student Affairs. And I'm very glad that the Dean of the Law School of Law, Jeremy Paul, has agreed to say a few words opening this event as well and to welcome all of you. So welcome to our discussion. Well, Dean Poiger, you thanked so many people, uh, but it's important for us to thank you for your well-chosen words uh, and your leadership in spearheading our community's effort tonight. Uh, during this heartbreaking April, in which so many have lost life and limb, I have been proud to be part of Northeastern University. Its ability to pull together to comfort those directly affected has inspired me. I hope it has done so for many of you. I am also proud to be part of this evening's meaningful <laughs> gathering where we will explore some of the many profound issues raised in the after aftermath of the diabolical actions of two young men. There are, of course, no words beyond we're sorry and we're here for you that can speak directly to the pain inflicted on the fallen, the injured, and their loved ones. But I can imagine no better way for the community as a whole to respond to such grotesque violence than to come together to explore the deepest values that bind us to each other and that render events such as those at the marathon a rare occurrence in American life. One of those values, of course, is the rule of law. I am grateful to my law school colleagues, Aziza Ahmed and Daniel Medwed, for lending their expertise to our forum tonight. Yet the rule of law we prize so dearly is hardly the sole province of lawyers seeking justice. It would perish in a flash without the bravery so brilliantly displayed by the first responders who arrived on the scene and the police officers who apprehended the suspects. It would wither without the integrity of journalists whom we trust to tell us the story so we can scoff when attention seekers toss around conspiracy theories. Nor could the rule of law survive without the cooperative spirit so clearly on display in the Boston area as residents remained in their homes to ease the task of law enforcement. Virtues such as justice, bravery, integrity, and cooperation thrive in environments that begin with understanding. Ultimately, a well-informed population is the best defense against the sort of prejudice that leads people to do violent things. We are here tonight to expand our own understandings. I thank all of you for coming, and I look forward to the discussion.
Thank you very much. It is then my pleasure to turn over the microphone to our moderator, Ralph Martin. Ralph Martin is Northeastern University's senior vice president. He is also a civic leader in Boston and in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Among many other high points in his career, Ralph Martin was the district attorney of Suffolk County and his work as prosecutor was recognized by President Bill Clinton and by Attorney General Janet Reno. Thank you, Ralph, for agreeing to moderate today's session. Thank you, Uta, and thank you, Jeremy, for uh, asking me to be involved in this uh, uh, wonderful effort. Um, and uh, a reminder to all of us, because I just did it myself, uh, please turn off your cell phones so we can make sure we have uh, a great but uninterrupted uh, conversation here t this evening. Um, I've been asked to moderate this panel discussion, which, uh, as you heard, is one in a series of community discussions here at Northeastern on civic engagement and sustainability in conjunction with the Presidential Council on Inclusion and Diversity. Tonight's discussion is one of many occurring throughout the city and indeed throughout the nation in an effort to explore and understand the Boston Marathon bombing and its aftermath. We only have 90 minutes tonight from the beginning of this discussion so let's get started. Uh, let me briefly introduce uh, our panel of uh, highly informed Northeastern faculty who will help lead our discussion tonight. And uh, I hope everyone has had a chance to look at the more comprehensive bios that were distributed before we begin. First, Aziza Ahmed teaches uh, at Northeastern University School of Law. Stephen Flynn is a uh, professor of political science at Northeastern and, and also um, the director of the Costas Research Institute. David Lazar is a professor of both political science and, and computer science. Jack McDevitt is the associate dean of research for the College of Social Sciences and Humanities here at Northeastern. Professor Daniel Medwood teaches law at the Northeastern University School of Law. And our last panelist, is uh, Gordana Rabrenovich, who is an associate professor here at Northeastern. And let me begin by asking each of the panelists to make some opening, opening remarks to help frame our discussion tonight. Aziza? Thank you so much for that introduction. Thank you to the university for recognizing the importance of hosting this conversation and organizing this event and for inviting me to be a part of it. Um, so in the wake of tragedy, there's often the desire to make sense of what happened, to assign blame, and to act with vigilance for the sake of justice. Since prior to September 11th, but crystallizing with the events of the World Trade Center, the Muslim, Arab, and South Asian community, and those often mistaken to be Muslim, have borne the brunt of this response and reaction. The terrible events at the Boston Marathon once again reignited the dark but unfortunately real side of American discourse about Muslims and national security. It is a way of speaking of Islam which conflates the religion with terrorism, closed-mindedness, backwardness, a unique form of oppression against women, and radicalism. It's reflected in the ideas and words that we use that are commonplace today, Islamicist, jihadist, radical, homegrown terror, sleeper cells, and now self-radicalization. Words brought to prominence, and sometimes actually invented by, conservative pundits and news agencies. Ill-defined terminology that we come to use now as though the meaning is self-evident. These ideas are driven home by television shows and movies that portray Muslims and Arabs as secret radicals, shows like 24, and then they're reproduced as fact by news agencies. On Friday, for example, I heard a discussion on CNN in which a terror expert sought to explain why all the stories of the 19-year-old being chased through Watertown by 9,000 police officers were coming up positive. He explained that some people, some Muslims and immigrants, act and look normal, that they may still have a compartmentalized rad radicalism that can turn on you at any time. In other words, even those people who are your friends and your neighbors may have a dark side fed by a deep connection to an alien country or community where they come from. 
Finally, the conflation of Islam with terrorism provides fodder for the ongoing mistreatment of Muslims. In 2011, the city of Boston ranked second highest for hate crimes in the country. And last year, we saw the massacre at a Wisconsin Gurdwara, a Sikh temple, but a community wrapped up in a lot of this anti-Muslim bias. The Supreme Court has not provided respite for Muslims and Arabs. One example is the egregious case of Iqbal v. Ashcroft. Javed Iqbal, a Pakistani, was arrested in terror sweeps that followed 9-11. Only South Asian and Arab men were arrested. Some of the men were held further because they were deemed of high interest. Iqbal was categorized this way for reasons unknown. Not a single person detained in these sweeps was ever charged on terrorism-related charges. Some had overstayed their visas or were undocumented, and they were charged with immigration-related offenses. Iqbal was detained for 150 days. He was subject to solitary confinement, repeated cavity searches. He was badly beaten and was not allowed to pray because he was told that there would be no prayer for terrorists. He was eventually sent back to Pakistan. Upon his release, Iqbal sued 34 current and former government officials, including John, Afcro Jan John Ashcroft, former Attorney General of the US, and Robert Mueller, the FBI Director. Coding politics and the language of procedure, the Supreme Court justified his detention and torture, providing tacit approval for the ongoing use of race and religion for national security purposes. In 2009, the Supreme Court said, and I'll just read to you from the decision, the September 11th attacks were perpetrated by 19 Arab and Muslim hijackers who counted themselves members in good standing of Al-Qaeda, an Islamic fundamentalist group. It should come as no surprise that a legitimate policy directing law enforcement to arrest and detain individuals because of their suspected links to the attacks would produce a disparate incidental impact on Arab Muslims, even though the purpose of the policy was to target neither Arabs nor Muslims. Iqbal obviously lost his case. In response to other Similar cases, the Center for Constitutional Rights, a key champion for the rights of Muslims post 9-11, once said that they question the ability of anyone who is Muslim to receive a truly fair trial in any American judicial forum post 9-11. This was not the first time the US court has justified the roundup of individuals in the context of national security. I'll end by reading you language from another decision, Korematsu, a Supreme Court case which justified the detention of Japanese Americans. An internment which took place only one year after President Roosevelt's Four Freedom speech, which is often remembered and regaled fondly with little acknowledgement of those who were denied these freedoms. In Korematsu, in language that eerily mirrors the Iqbal court decision, the court said, Korematsu was not excluded from the military area because of hostility for him or his race. He was excluded because we are at war with the Japanese Empire because the properly constituted military authorities feared an invasion of our west coast and felt constrained to take proper security measures because they decided that the military urgency of the situation demanded that all, situa all, that all citizens of Japanese ancestry be segregated from the west coast temporarily. And finally, because Congress, reposing its confidence in this time of war in our military leaders, as inevitably it must, determined that they, they should have the power to do this. The dominant discourse of national security is one historically inflected with deep bias against immigrants and minorities, and now with a deep anti-Muslim bias. We must use these strategies to reevaluate how to conceive of who is threatening to us, what are the legal consequences of this, how do we conceive of security, and who gets to be secure, both at a global level and a local level. And finally, we must ask, how does relying on fear about one community distract us from real questions of legal transformation about how to end violence? Thank you. Great, I'm Steve Flynn. I'm the uh, co-director of the CASAS uh, Research Institute. My fellow co-director, Peter Boynton, is here with me today as well. An honor to be here tonight to talk about this issue. I come in, our focus of the work at the CASAS Institute is on the issue of homeland security, but particularly around this concept of resilience. And the events of this last week have really sort of drove home seems to me why this is a very important uh, uh, area of focus for our efforts, and frankly, how proud I am to be from this part of the world and how well this community and the city, I think, responded. It really, I think, had a salutary effect on the nation by seeing how well Bostonians dealt with this tragedy. And this conversation, I think, is important going forward. It's to the context in terms of the terrorism issue evolution that we've seen in recent years is that we're moving away from the 9-11 scale large, essentially conspiracy to do 
massive catastrophic events, shifting towards much smaller efforts, where the objective is to cause mass disruption. Uh, Commissioner Ray Kelly of the NYPD calls it the let the thousand flower bloom approach. Basically, if I can just energize small levels of activity even with relatively crude weapons, as long as a society overreacts after the event, we can achieve the goal. In other words, you don't need a spectacular act of violence that's profoundly disruptive in a military sense. You can trigger, essentially, a costly reaction by the society by potentially doing some relatively small-scale things. So it's something that folks in our field have been looking at for quite some time with concern. And it seems very clear from what we have for status so far, that's exactly pretty much what we had play out today, the, the uh, last week, recruiting essentially and radicalizing domestically based folks who took crude weapons and went out and did something truly horrific. And how we reacted was a very important, I think, piece about uh, the story. Very importantly, I would argue Boston did not overreact in the immediate aftermath of this event. We did all the right things, competently dealt with the folks who were hurt, uh, got on with it. School was open on Tuesday. Businesses were open on Tuesday. We, transit was moving on Tuesday. And that's something that's very, very important because if the objective of terrorism is to cause mass disruption, our resilience in the face of terrorism starts to drain that motivation for doing it. This also, I'd argue, applies to our values. If we're, our values have to be resilient as well. We can't get into this false trade-off between you want more security, it's less liberty. What we're trying to secure are our liberties. We're trying to secure our way of life, and we have to make sure we're not delivering up, as a result of an act of terror, the loss of those basic uh, core liberties and responsibilities, especially on something that happens on Patriot's Day. Four big lessons I, that I have I came out of the Boston uh, event here. First, all response always is local. We have a lot of national security apparatus. We have a lot of federal apparatus. The difference that will be between life and death is who the bystanders are next to you on these events. It's a neighbor, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a some of you may have a stranger, it's a family member, it's local law enforcement, public safety, emergency management, fire department, they will spell the difference. That's where the capacity lies when these events happen, always will be that way. There's never enough feds to go around and they're usually a long distance away. So understanding that response is local means that's something we need to focus on, having that capacity to deal with these events when they can't always be prevented. Okay, second, in the aftermath, it's really important to essentially figure out what happened, to bound the risk. The more the risk feels unbounded, the more basically sloppy the response gets. Right, if you don't know basically how this is happening and risk feels it's quite dangerous, you could potentially to tell a million people to shelter in place not probably the best tool for managing this risk because intelligence isn't answering questions in the aftermath of these events often quick enough, you can end up with these sort of cascading disruptions. So all of the intelligence effort we have today is focused on preventing things. And they almost, if something goes wrong, it's like, well, pff, come and clean up the mess. Actually, one of the key elements of dealing with the aftermath is figuring out what happened very quickly and getting in useful information to key decision makers. And that's something we gotta get better at because we can't always prevent these events. Right? Third, it's so important to get back on with it. I had a friend of mine from Israel sent me a note on Monday night, expression, you know, sympathy for what we're going through here. So remember, you've got to basically get back to normal as soon as possible. That's their approach, it's the British approach, and it's what Boston did. And that's important because, again, you're depriving the disruptive value. Finally, we need to celebrate resilience when we see it. And when we need to tell the stories about how we capably responded, that what we saw with emergency responders, what happened in our medical centers, what, how basically we deal with all these stories. Those are important. And I think I would argue the two days, basically, that we didn't know anything about who the adversary forced the media to tell us stories that we needed to know that were quite true, which is how well we are coping with this. Now we're in the manhunt stories. And the why were they, you know, when we went to the manhunt, boy, chasing sirens was really easy for the media. And then now we're in who, where, why were they, how could we have prevented it? And then we can get congressmen to say stupid things. And so this is a great media story. But we miss is how did the community respond and what's going on there to get back up on its feet? 
And so why a conversation like this tonight is very important is, of course, our own processing, since we are so close to it, but also because we need to illustrate to the rest of the country that we can have these kinds of events and we can sort it out and get back on with our lives. Thank you. You'll excuse the, uh, the image, uh, but uh, this was sort of the moment that uh, things uh, started, and I think it, it was a moment that, uh, that affected us all, and uh, in ways great and small, uh, whether it's because, uh, because we were there, whether we were affected, whether it's just because uh, it all unfolded near here. Uh, in my own very small way, it affected me in the sense that uh, my wife runs marathons. I, I, have pizza while she uh, while she runs, uh, typically, uh, but uh, but then at the end of the race, uh, you know, I'll be there with my daughter, you know, cheering her on, and she ends uh, the race actually just about the same time uh, that uh, that the bombs went off, and that's almost exactly the spot uh, that we uh, that we stand. Uh, so it is uh, it's one of those things that whenever uh, I watch her run a race again, it will be it will be in my mind. Um, and, um, and so the, inevitably in this era, uh, when we look at, uh, let's say if we compare to 9-11, uh, to, uh, that uh, the huge difference in terms of our capacity to express our reactions uh, is social media, right? We didn't have Facebook, we didn't have Twitter. And so the question is, that, that I uh, was interested in, or I think that that's important to reflect on, is what difference did this make? And how did, how, what's the looking glass uh, that, uh, that gets reflected back uh, when, when we look at the social media? So let's see, where's the, oh, there we go, sorry. Um, and so uh, looking at, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about uh, Twitter uh, in particular. Uh, because, because all of that's public, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about other social media uh, as well. Uh, but, um, but you could see, when you look at tweets uh, from Boston, you could see this progression uh, of emotions. And I think uh, number one role of Twitter, frankly, is uh, expressing uh, emotion. That is, uh, the, the main thing that was being expressed was how people were feeling. Uh, and the first reaction, unsurprisingly, was fear. Right? You could see uh, a, a clear progression from fear, uh, and you can see a few uh, exemplary uh, tweets uh, to anger, and I, I'm not showing you those tweets because uh, they were mostly involved obscenities of various kinds. Uh, and, then, uh, and then sympathy. Um, and, and, uh, and I think this gets back to uh, the resilience uh, that we were uh, talking about a moment ago. Um, we, um, and you can see this graphically. Um, we here, I, we, we extracted uh, from Boston-based tweets uh, various emotions. So, you know, you have to keep in mind Twitter is a bit of a self-absorbed uh, medium. So we plotted joy over time, and it actually, uh, there was no, there was no change in joy uh, in in the tweets. That is, there are a lot of people who are, who are completely ignored uh, the events who were in Boston uh, during the day. Uh, but where you saw a big uh, change. Um, was so this is has the day before above and then the day the day of uh, below and uh, where you see a huge spike uh, was in fear uh, around uh, the moment of the bombings uh, where there was a where there was an enormous increase in uh, expressions of fear uh, in in uh, right after the bombing and uh, and you can also see this uh, geographically uh, where you can see at 3 p.m. it was quite you know there was a big spike around Copley Square and the, the center of Boston, and then by 4 p.m. it had really uh, spread uh, quite a bit all, all through uh, Boston uh, as people were grappling and trying to understand uh, what, what was happening. Uh, and it wasn't at all clear, actually, uh, what was uh, the magnitude of events uh, but when you got to 4 p.m. Um, and the next thing you saw in terms of, uh, you saw expressions of emotion, then there was an element of trying to make sense of what was happening, because you know, initially all you knew there were, were, were that there was explosions, and then the moment that you say there's a bombing, you're attributing a reason uh, for the explosions. And so you see this quick, very quick movement from explosion 
to bombing within minutes in the tweets. And then there's the question of who, who did it, and you can see, uh, unsurprisingly, various hypothesizing about who did it. In interestingly, um, you know, I was, when I was looking through this, I thought, you know, you'd think you see Al-Qaeda uh, pop up a lot. Uh, but in fact, it was North Korea that popped up a, uh, popped up a lot. It was uh, 30 to 1 uh, uh, people uh, suggesting initially that it was somehow the Koreans uh, were bombing us, uh, which, which surprised me. Um, and, um, um, and, you know, unsurprisingly, this unfolded, uh, this trying to understand things unfolded in a way that was, of course, uh, quite uh, interdependent in terms of how people were bouncing off of each other and trying to make sense of the facts, uh, as well as things that were not facts. Um, there was also the, an element, and this was a very tiny fraction of the tweets, but there was an element of bearing uh, witness uh, this was in Twitter as well as on other social media, people, individ uh, individuals reporting proprietary knowledge about what they had seen, right? So this is not mediated by newspapers or television. This is individual citizens saying, I saw the bombing and here's what I saw. Or, you know, there's a tweet, uh, you know, at one point there was a report that, that, that uh, there was a bombing at the JFK library. Uh, people are tweeting, oh, I'm at the JFK library and this looks very different. Right? That was bearing witness uh, to what was happening. Uh, I'm curious, and like, like uh, uh, for example, in my case, and I'd be interested in the audience's uh, uh, reactions on this. Um, you know, I had, uh, you know, unsurprisingly, I have I have uh, teenage daughters, and uh, and they and I know lots of parents with teenage kids, and so one of them, uh, had a son, was in the friend circle of the uh, younger. A suspect, and she was telling, talking about this on Facebook, right? Uh, and uh, and subsequently, actually, was quoted in the Boston Globe and so on. And I'm curious how many people in the audience, where other people had this experience, where through social media, you are hearing things that that people who actually had firsthand knowledge of stuff. Uh, did you see that in Facebook, uh, for example? Could you raise your hand if you saw something? So so quite a bit, quite a few people. How about someone uh, tweeting via Twitter? Uh, any, uh, and so you see, you see, this is very different, right? This is not, uh, this this is not like 9/11. You would not, you have had uh, very few hands going up uh, uh, during 9/11, um, and in part this has to do because this is we're embedded in the community in which this happened. But you know, if 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 we were talking about n uh, New York and 9/11, um, it would have been a very different uh, story. Um, the uh, there's the question of. Uh, information spread more generally, uh, and information could be correct information or incorrect information. I'm curious, uh, and I just want to go through these. Uh, how many people first heard about the bombing through, say, some face-to-face -face means, someone coming knocking on your door, did you see, hear those bombings? So there, uh, you know, a dozen hands or so. What about uh, mobile phone calls, your phone rang? So uh, quite, quite a few people. How about a landline a phone? So there's some, <laughs> some generational uh, difference there. Um, how about a text? Uh, yeah, so uh, again, the generational, uh, some generational effect there. What about via Twitter? Okay, and how about Facebook? Okay, uh, other social media that I haven't mentioned? You know, Tumblr, Reddit, so uh, a, few, a few other social media. And what about TV or radio? Okay, so you see, this was a very different distribution than we would have seen uh, after 9/11, right? Because that would have been uh, it would have been either TV or radio. It would have been, uh, and the other thing I, I didn't get into is how many were one step removed. Uh, how many of you? I'll ask this question too. How many of you heard from people who th heard through uh, TV or radio, one way or the other? So you see a few hands, but actually. Uh, th this is a very different information diffusion process uh, than we had uh, in 9-11. And, uh, and, and this matters. How it matters, we're still, still grappling with, right? Uh, but uh, it, it matters in terms of how you adapt it. It, ma it matters in terms of the, you know, how rumors disseminate. It matters how we, as a community, uh, uh, cope with this. Um, and, uh, but this is, you know, things are very different now in terms of how we mutually uh, deal uh, with this event, and it's because of Twitter and Facebook. It's because uh, it's because 
uh, mobile phones, uh, cell phones, means that we're all instantly available. You know, if you walk away from your landline, you're not accessible, you're off the grid. I mean, it's hard to remember uh, but li what life was like, but actually that's what life was like, and actually a lot of people didn't have cell phones even uh, back 11 years ago, much less what are sort of supercomputers in our pockets. Um, uh, th there was also an element of crowdsourcing uh, the investigation, both purposive and non-purposive. Um, so, you know, one one uh, important element, uh, one 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 dimension of this is we, we, we was it became clear how how much we live in a surveillance society in a way that's distributed, right? It's not that we have the government that has cameras everywhere. I mean, there are some government cameras. But in fact, the key breaks came from uh, video cameras from across uh, the street uh, in, um, in a department store. Um, and there were a multitude of pictures from the event that became relevant. So like someone posted a picture from the marathon uh, uh, on Facebook, uh, and then one of the person's friends said, I think that's uh, one of the bombers that's uh, in the picture behind you, right? Um, that there was this sort of collective processing of the information in a way that just, would, again, would have been uh, inconceivable. It would have seemed like science fiction just a few years ago. Um, there was also an active sorting of the evidence in ways that were productive and unproductive. Uh, Reddit had an active community uh, that was trying to sort through the photographic evidence. Um, and uh, identified uh, someone who uh, who was not uh, uh, was not ever suspected uh, but of uh, committing uh, the crime. Um, uh, uh, so, um, and on the other hand, I, I'd note in terms of traditional media, the New York Post uh, also posted uh, on their front page uh, two people who had nothing to do uh, with the bombing. Uh, but also, the big break from this really came from when the when law enforcement decided to crowdsource the investigation when they said we're. Put, we're putting up these two pictures, uh, the pictures of these two people. Uh, tell us, uh, co please contact us. Right? I mean, again, this isn't this this kind of methodology goes back to putting pictures up uh, in the post office uh, in terms of most wanted. Uh, but uh, but it's, it it it's a very different velocity in today's world uh, than putting those pictures up in the post office. Um, and so uh, and so we it, it really reflects the fact that we are constantly being. Uh, our, our, our record, well, I'm being recorded right now. Um, so we're constantly being recorded uh, and, uh, and that there's this sort of peer-to-peer -peer process that allows a collective processing of this, uh, again, for better or for worse. Um, and indeed, uh, we, can, we can see uh, a lot of rumors spreading also, I, I should know. And how many, how many people heard, for example, that cell phone service was uh, shut down in downtown Boston by authorities, right? Uh, wrong did not you know that was not uh, that did not happen uh, cell phone service did go down uh, or slow down quite a bit because lots of people were trying to use their cell phones right um, you know how many people heard that there were two eight-year-olds uh, killed uh, this was another common uh, rumor uh, fewer but still a decent number and so there were a million rumors going around uh, many of which were false although not all of which were false uh, and again, this all happened with a velocity that could that that w it was really unbelievable uh, based on on how life was just a few years ago. But also, there was this error correction process where people said the wrong thing, but other people, when they found out that it was wrong, corrected it. Um, so, I, 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 in this vein, I do want to I, I do want to just mention, and it's my last slide, uh, professors, I'm afraid, tend to talk too long, um, that there will be an effort around developing um, developing an archive and a record of what happened. Uh, I have a website called Volunteer Science, and we're going to actually launch an Android app to for people to answer questions on. We're talking about launching an archive, a website next week uh, that will allow people to upload their stories and their pictures. And this is with the support of the university, um, and uh, and so I hope that uh, I hope that some of you will participate in um, in these efforts uh, to to capture the moment and record it in a way that's productive and going forward. Uh, so thank you. Hi everybody, and thank you for coming. Um, I think that. It, 
What we're hoping tonight is to give you a variety of perspectives, and I think what you're seeing is that there are a variety of perspectives, and then to engage in a conversation with you about how those perspectives merge or differ from your own. Uh, I'm going to talk to you. I'm uh, from the Department of uh, School Soci of Criminology and Criminal Justice, and I want to give you, from a criminologist's point of view, a little bit of some things that we know from criminal, re criminal justice research that might be helpful in terms of understanding some of this. Um, to follow along what Aziza talked to you about, the notion of how one retaliates when the, an incident like this occurs. Unfortunately, in the area of hate crime, one of the most common causes of hate crimes are retaliatory. That somebody sees an incident, hears about an incident, and decides they're going to take it into their own hands. It's not particularly against the person who perpetrated it, but it might be a person who looks like that or a person who you believe might think like that. And so to think, though, that, OK, that happens, yeah, how does that relate to what happened here? The largest number of hate crimes in the history of the United States took place within days after 9-11, with lots and lots of folks saying, we are going to pay them back. We're not going to wait for the justice system. We're going to do the damage ourselves. I think, as Steve talked about, the city of Boston and the greater Boston community has to be proud that we didn't see a spike in those kinds of incidents. But my cautionary note to you is that the second place where that starts to happen, as, as evidence starts to come out around the investigation and the trial, and people hear the details of things, and they start to say, OK, the justice system isn't moving fast enough. These people might not get the punishment they deserve and they try to take matters into their own hands. I don't think that will happen in Boston, but I wanted to offer that as a cautionary note. A second point that I'll offer to you is that you hear a debate now about whether or not this person is associated with a terrorist group or how associated they are. Well, again, we have some data in, from hate crime data that looks at this and starts to say, well, how many hate crime offenders are associated with white supremacist group or any organized hate group? You know what the number is? Less than 3%. Most of the offenders who are involved in this kind of behavior are offenders who may have read about those, those beliefs, but they're not actively engaged in those kind of groups. They play these things off on themselves. They see themselves as heroes or people going forward to do the work that other people won't do. So it, it probably isn't surprising that there aren't links. There may be links that come out as part of the investigation, but the, it's not surprising if we look at criminology for that. The final point I'd make, and to just be quick, and then we'll come back to have some conversation, is in any kind of crime where there's multiple participants, we struggle as a society with culpability. How culpable are people? Is everybody equally culpable who's involved? And you hear that conversation right now, the older brother, the younger brother, all of that. And I, I would offer this by way of sort of some research that's been done in, in criminology and how it might be helpful. We tend to put group crimes into a, cat, a set of four categories. So there's usually one person who's the leader, the person whose idea it is, who initiates the action. They may not even be there the day that it happens, but they're the spark that causes the crime to be occurring. There's usually one or other people who we see as fellow travelers. They may never have done this if the leader hadn't been the one to say, let's go do this. But they didn't step back. They said, yeah, this might be fun. This might be good. We might, maybe we should do this. And we see this other group that sort of gets pulled along. And I don't mean to say that there's a parallel here in, these kind of, in this crime, but it's an unwilling participant. It's the kid in the back seat of the car when the car is going out to beat up someone who's black or who's Middle Eastern, who doesn't want to be there, but doesn't know how to get themselves out of the car. And their, their culpability is different than the person that suggests this, the person that gets the weapons. Their culpability is different, but they're culpable. And the fourth category, and, and I could see as we hear the investigation come forward that there'll be, there may be people 
who had knowledge of what these individuals were going to do and didn't come forward and didn't step forward and do something. But the fourth category, and those that, this word's been used a lot, but it, it does stand out here, are heroes. And a hero in the event is the person that takes the step away from going forward and tries to stop it, tries to intervene, tries to say we shouldn't do this. They may not have been successful, but they tried to stop it. That's what we mean by heroism. And those are the people that aren't culpable. All the other folks have a level of culpability. And we saw heroes in terms of the people, citizens, the police officers, the firefighters who responded the way they did. But hopefully during the investigation, we'll find some other folks who attempted to step in and stop this when they heard about it happening. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Good evening. Uh, I'm Daniel Medwed in the College of Law or School of Law. Um, I'd like to start off by just talking about how um, we all like to process things differently. One way that I like to process tragedy is to put a label on my feelings. So I'm just going to throw out a few words and raise your hand if you're feeling the same thing I'm feeling. Sadness, anger, a little bit of relief after Friday night, and fundamentally vulnerability. How many of you feel vulnerable? That's a feeling that stayed with me through the weekend and even today, the sense of vulnerability for all of us, just my personal security, my family's security, my two young daughters, my students, my loved ones, but also the vulnerability of our culture. What could happen next? The uncertainty of daily life. And as I've reflected on that idea of what it means to be vulnerable, part of me thinks I need to be more vigilant. We need to be more vigilant. We need to be more careful. But then. Over time, I've realized that's not the answer for me, at least, that the answer lies in something a little different. And I'm a defense lawyer, so this may not be a surprise. It lies in the Constitution. <laughs> the hallmark of a civilized society is the extent to which we protect the constitutional rights of our worst members. If we cede an inch in this case, if we don't protect the most evil among us, then it's a slippery slope to the rest of us if we trample on the Constitution for people whom we believe in the heat of the moment, when we're angry and sad, vulnerable, maybe a little bit of relieved, then what could happen next? So let's just talk briefly about the Constitution. Again, I'm a defense lawyer, grain of salt. But I just want to talk about three, three particular moments that might be salient in the weeks ahead. The Miranda issue that's been in the news a lot, which in my view is a complete red herring. Second, the federal versus state prosecution. And third, the venue for this trial, because there will undoubtedly be a change of venue motion. Okay? So first, Miranda. The legal issues in this case, in my view, started the moment that suspect number two was apprehended in the boat. At that moment, he was in custody, or in Miranda ease. Miranda versus Arizona was a 1966 Supreme Court case many of you are familiar with. He was in custody, and any ensuing questions were part of a custodial interrogation. What Miranda tells us is that in order to comply with the Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination, suspect who is in a custodial interrogation must be warned in advance of three things, right? That they have the right to remain silent, that anything they say can and may be used against them in a court of law, and that they have a right to an attorney. Those are the three major things. But Miranda, which has gained a lot of importance in uh, mainstream television programs, Law and Order, really is just a rule of evidence. It just relates to the use of statements at trial. It doesn't relate to investigations. The police can ask whatever they want. They can essentially, if you're in custody, you can be interrogated. You don't have to be asked to, whether you want an attorney or not. It's just that those statements can't be used against you at trial. So the reason why I viewed this Miranda issue to be a bit of a red herring is I can't imagine for a second that law enforcement officers were ever going to Mirandize him. They didn't need it. They didn't need his statements in a future trial. But they did need certain things. They needed information. They needed to know whether there were undetonated bombs nearby. They needed to know whether or not the suspect was aware of any imminent threats. That was important, critical information that they needed. The case was secondary at the moment. 
So Miranda seems to be a little bit of a red herring. We can talk later about the public safety uh, exception, and I'll tell you a little bit about what I know about it. But at the end of the day, the prosecutors have almost nothing to lose. Worst case scenario, they violate Miranda, and they can't use statements that they don't need because there's already a tremendous amount of evidence, at least given what we know, against this particular suspect. So that's Miranda. Second, state versus federal prosecution. We know now that the U.S. Attorney's Office here in Boston um, has sought, has filed criminal charges against suspect number two, two charges, one relating to the use and conspiring to use a weapon of mass destruction, and the other relate, related to the malicious destruction of property. Notably, those aren't specifically terror-related charges. That's important. I would imagine as well, it's quite possible, we don't know for certain, that there will be state charges related to the murder of Officer Collier. That is a classic state crime. I believe that federal prosecutors would be very hard pressed to find federal jurisdiction for a charge there, maybe under uh, the so-called RICO statute, but that could be a stretch. So that's possible. Why is it significant? The major significance between the federal versus state prosecution boils down, in my view, to a rather basic issue, which you no doubt are aware of. Under federal law, prosecutors may seek the death penalty. Whereas in Massachusetts, as a matter of state law, as the Supreme Judicial Court has interpreted our state constitution, there is no death penalty. So the interesting issue now is starting, it will happen in Washington, D.C., when uh, Eric Holder and leaders in Maine Justice get together with Carmen Ortiz, our U.S. attorney, and begin to consider whether or not death penalty charges are warranted. As a matter of practice, in federal cases in states where there is no death penalty, currently there is the death penalty in 33 states. In those 17 states, as a matter of practice, not a rule, but as a matter of practice, usually federal prosecutors do not seek to apply the death penalty. Under Attorney General Holder's regime, however, sparingly, a handful of times, I believe half a dozen times, federal prosecutors have sought the death penalty in federal cases in states where there is no death penalty, including at least once in Massachusetts. So there may very well be a death penalty case in federal court in Massachusetts. Third thing, uh, a change of venue. Um, Professor Lazar talked about a lot of the interesting differences between 9-11. Um, one very interesting and, and sobering difference is that the principles in the 9-11 um, crimes were dead, they died at the scene. And so there wasn't a distinct target for the public to direct its animus at, right? Here we have somebody, we have a person who we can actually look to, a person whom we believe, and many people believe, and certainly prosecutors believe, was behind these terrible acts. This might create some complications in the potential trial. It may be difficult to uh, get a fair trial in Boston, or let alone in the District of Massachusetts, or at least that's what the federal defenders will almost invariably argue. So I would imagine that the, if there is no plea bargain, and that's a major if, because I would guess that there's going to be one, but if there were no plea bargain, there's going to be a major battle over change of venue. And chances are, if the case is moved, it will be somewhere in this judicial circuit, in the first circuit, maybe Maine or Connecticut, but possibly not in Massachusetts. So those are just a few of the legal issues, and um, we can take them up later if you're interested. Thank you. And finally, <laughs> you have me. Um, I am uh, Gordon Arabrenovic, and I'm a sociologist here at Northeast University. And we sociologists are always asked to explain things uh, that happen in society. So here is some of the thoughts that I had about uh, this case. Also, being a director of Brodnik Center on studying conflict and violence, we are doing, we are working on a study on deradicalization. So I have some insights from that study as well. Why do individuals choose violence to fight for their causes? How do we explain radicalization of Tsarnev's brothers? What we know from the stories of individuals who embrace violence is that they do not feel fulfilled and respected by the people around them. They're looking for a place in a society that will make them feel safe and appreciated. In the words of fellow criminologist Glenn Pierce, they're looking for a home. Tamerlan and Zahar Tsarnev came to United States as children. The older brother seems to have had difficulties in adjusting to American way of life. He did not have many friends. He dropped out of school. His boxing career was short-lived, and his relationship with women were volatile. 
it seems that he found a home in radical interpretation of religion. Tamerlan's story is not that different from the stories of other young men who joined radical organizations. In the Brodnik Center, we are currently working on a study of the de radicalization of young people who embrace violence by becoming members of the white supremacist groups and gangs. Most of the young men that Carol Kaufman interview as part of this study feel welcomed by the groups they join. The, ideolo the ideology came later. Tamerlan may have been motivated by vanity and was seeking glory. He may have felt inferior and resentful. It also seems that there was a gap between his expectations and the reality of his life. It also seems that this radicalization came via access to internet sites. Zohar motivation is harder to explain based on what we know so far about his life. He may have re uh, reacted based on the family loyalty and pressure from his brother. In the case of Tamerlan, radicalization may have been initially motivated by individual grievances. Later, these grievances appear to have been connected to group grievances. They're not doing this to me as an individual, he may have reason, but as a part of the group I belong to. Once grievances are seen as being committed by the other group against your own group, the other becomes dehumanized and normal feelings of empathy may disappear. The combination of anger and lack of empathy as extreme circumstances can produce a foundation of violent action. The critical question for our society is, how can we involve the whole community in preventing radicalization and also facilitate their, their radicalization? On April 18, BBC had a short fragment on, uh, segment on Boston Muslims reacting to uh, uh, marathon bombs. After denouncing the bombing, interviewed individuals, including a student from our own university, also shared their worries that if the terrorists happened to be Muslim, it would prove everyone's stereotypes. For the same reason, I have also hoped that the perpetrator of the, or the perpetrators were not immigrants. Terrorist actions try to undermine the tenets of our society. One of the important tenets of American society is justice for all. You know, I'm often asked as a naturalized American, am I proud to be American? And what I tell them is that I am proud to be American because this is a country that has justice for all. We don't necessarily always live up to it, but this is important tenets that we have. Uh, we should treat people as equal under the law. The fear of terrorist actions may push some people to embrace hatred of individuals or groups of people that they define as dangerous. The, pe the perception of danger is more important than the reality of the situation. Some may use this fear to justify harsh treatment of other members of the group that perpetrator is a member. Or they may use it to influence public policy that will make it harder for the other members to obtain their rights. In our response to terrorism, we must always remember never to equate the action of violent individuals or small groups of individuals to the larger groups to uh, which they have affiliation or the simply, that simply weakens our society and in Bodden's future would be terrorist. We have to make sure that we do not allow such events as Monday's bombing to take us away from what we made us a strong nation, our belief in justice, inclusion, and opportunity for all. Adhering to these principles will make us a stronger and safer nation. Thank you very much to our panelists for beginning the discussion with some insights and some analysis about some of the issues that are beginning to surface as this case unfolds. Let me briefly frame tonight's discussion, perhaps in an, in an effort to uh, uh, distill and absorb the comments from our panelists. Although I did not write the following statement, I chose it to help precipitate, if not provoke, some insight and reaction from our panelists and audience. So here's the statement. Last week, the melting pot met the pressure cooker bomb. The Boston Marathon bombing, apparently carried out by brothers of Chechen and Russian origin, did more than shine a light on the phenomenon of homegrown terrorism. The brothers have become the latest to strain the proposition that America is a great country precisely because it is a melting pot, bringing together people of all races, ethnicities, accents, and, and experiences. The writer, Gerald Seib of the Wall Street Journal, also observed that the idea of America as a melting pot is about to undergo a stress test. 
So let's explore some of those stresses in tonight's discussion in a forthright, respectful, and candid manner. So let me start with where Daniel left off. Uh, a prosecution is being assembled against Zokar. Uh, Daniel uh, talked about uh, the, shall we say, the lack of importance in the scheme of things of the Miranda rights. But there are elements that are important that distinguish this as not just another murder, not just a violent act, um, including but not limited to if you, if you take it as uh, being truthful, the statement that they made to the person that was hijacked, you're not an American, we're gonna let you live. What are the elements that really differentiate this and is this a terrorist act? Is that for me? Yeah, well let's start with <laughs> that's you. That's a big let's question. Start with you. Um, <laughs> yes or no? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, may I plead the privilege against uh, self-incrimination? No, of course uh, you may. For not knowing the answer. Um, uh, the, the, the term terrorism is a term that has both um, cultural and legal ramifications. Uh, as a matter of law, my understanding, and I'm not an expert in this area, maybe others are, um, the terror does relate to the idea of not just committing an act of, of, uh, of killing or harming other people, but intending, there's a specific intent element in the law, specifically intending to instill fear in others. And there may be, in fact, I, we don't know, or I certainly am not privy to the uh, uh, evidence in this case, there may be evidence suggesting that there is probable cause, that's the, the standard for filing charges, probable cause to proceed with some type of uh, charge that is terror related. Though as I noted, the particular charges, these two, notice, not, notably do not include the word terror or are not explicitly uh, terror related uh, uh, charges. Uh, but Ralph, as to your uh, initial point, which is incredibly important, what what makes this different? Uh, I think, for me at least, in looking at it, this sense of uh, the undetonated bombs and that even before the manhunt, because of the chase and the fact that they were seen um, essentially throwing uh, bombs at the police, there was this sense of a broader public safety issue, which is not something that is often the case in a run-of-the-mill homicide uh, that uh, would not necessarily have those ramifications. I think that's what makes this case especially different. So to follow that theme, uh, one of the things that the government has to contemplate as part of the assemblage of a case is motive, because motive distinguishes um, uh, certain categories of crime and certain degrees of crime from others. Uh, what are the elements that we know about today uh, that help uh, distinguish, by virtue of motive, uh, this from other violent acts? Whether, and anyone can take a run at that. Steve. I don't, we don't, of course, know yet, and it'll take a while to discern, but we, we've looked at this form of terrorism in terms of those who are advocating through the sort of radicalization process, advocacy is the goal you're trying to achieve is to get a reaction from the society you're targeting that will be destructive for that society, a costly, uh, and potentially get it to behave in ways that will not be supportive of that society and be supportive of your cause. What we're not sure yet, of course, is how much this has been thought out with these two individuals, you know, wh where they were in this continuum of purposefulness. But in terms of what is uh, the shift from, again, putting these full-scale kind of conspiracy 9-11 efforts together, the current sort of view is you can you should engage in these kinds of attacks against the targeted society with this objective of fear, not just for fear's sake, fear so that you generate that, that fear leads to self-destructive or costly uh, response to the targeted society. So that that's the purpose of these kinds of attacks when it's done in those ways. Whether or not this attack is going to fit entirely in that realm is something we're going to have to find from the investigation. Two of our panelists have talked about uh, the implications uh, of certain terms that have been used by the media and others, self-radicalization being one. 
And I guess the, the question I have is, does that term actually describe or encompass in total the motives of one or both brothers? And do we have an adequate definition of the term self-radicalization -radical by virtue of either usage or contemporary adaptation? I don't think that we actually have a definition of self-radicalization yet, but there is some understanding that self-radicalization means that the person did it on its own, coming out of their own hand. Um, um, and what we know is that you have individual motivations, that they are, in, they are motivated by some uh, uh, individual grievances, but those grievances are not just what's happening to them. They see them in a larger context, and therefore they get amplified by talking to other people, and especially those chat groups and internet is a good place to get uh, uh, verification to your feelings. You don't, uh, as we look at for uh, um, people who get radicalized, they, they were unhappy and uh, they don't feel value. They don't, they don't have a home and they do not know why is that happening and they blame other people but when they join some of these uh, uh, groups or they meet other people, they gave them ideology. All of a sudden, they have a meaning. All of a sudden, there's aha moment. Aha, now I know why that happened. It's not because who I am, but because I am a member of this particular group, because this is who I am. And so I would say that this self-radicalization, it's not uh, uh, that you are doing on your own. It might be that you are, might not be recruited by someone else. You might be the one who goes and, and actually search for contact, and you find it. So self-radicalization, I think, uh, can be seen in that way, that it, it is self-motivated, but not that it is developed in isolation from the larger society. Yeah. I, just to follow along with what Gordon has said, and it, it's really important that, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago certainly, if you had some of these ideas, you're thinking, should I, what, who do I blame for the situation I find myself in? You had friends, you had, uh, you know, different acquaintances that you had to talk to, and you st who's going to share this feeling with me? The circle was so small. Now the internet, the circle is so much larger. It's so much bigger. In, in the world of hate groups, there's 1,500 hate sites on the internet that you can log into and you can hear other people saying, as Gordon has said, you know, it's not your fault. It's because they're picking on you because you're a member of this group. And so, and then spur each other on to this is what should happen and come to these kind of very radical, and we've seen how this can play itself out. So I think that in that way, things have really changed. And there is this opportunity for people to find kindred spirits, to, to even if there's one or two people, but they're coming up in many different personas on the internet, there's ways that they, that this sort of motivates individuals and they use this um, process. And I think David has probably studied as much as anybody. Aziza? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm the microphone guy. <laughs> um, yeah, no, so, you know, I think one of the things that's interesting about this conversation is that how, how few definitions we do have to work with. So, you know, we're talking about terrorism, we're talking about self-radicalization, we're unsure if we're all having the same conversation, um, and, you know, this is a very conscious and thoughtful group of scholars, so, you know, you're not getting it from this table necessarily, but when we discuss these issues in the public media, we often don't have a clear sense of the issues that we are actually talking about. Uh, you know, the definition of terrorism also implicates the state, non-state actor distinction. Um, that's an important distinction because, of course, if state actors could be terrorists, then we would be, you know, um, implicated in many more, we would be bringing in many more acts of violence. Um, and we also have to be careful about this, you know, just to come back to what I spoke about, you know, what does it mean that we use terrorism in some cases and not others? So, for example, why not with school shootings? Um, why not with the incident at the Gurdwara? And I'm not suggesting that we keep broadening terrorism and this discussion to encompass all, all of these acts of violence, but um, there is something to be said for when we are using this term and why we are using it. Um, so just to put that out there. David, did you have a, a comment? Um, I'll just echo uh, the what we're talking about in terms of the internet. That the, the I mean, there there have been acts of 
There have been bombings, acts of terror uh, that go back uh, quite a long way before uh, the Internet. Now, the question, and I, I actually uh, don't claim expertise in terms of the social processes enabling someone to do this damage, but there's no doubt that you can get instructions uh, and expertise in doing damage and instructions in terms of ideology of various kinds today uh, with greater ease uh, than you could have uh, just a, a few years ago. Um, and so there is that access uh, in both the, the ideological uh, sense and in both the, the notion that you could build a, a bomb from a pressure cooker with detailed instructions uh, that, that, that any teenager could, uh, could find on the internet is, is, uh, is mind-boggling, so. Yeah, the last thing I would add is just that it's a very small percentage of people who may get drawn to a radical ideology and sort of internalize that, who actually then act on that mm -hmm. in very violent ways. So there's sort of, well, why, you know, isn't, if law enforcement wouldn't do a better job, it really is a needle in a haystack challenge to find the individual who's both motivated and then acquires capability and then acts on that in the kinds of ways that we saw here. We're now in very, very small numbers. So let me turn to another subject. And by the way, uh, you do not have to wait for a prompt if you want to uh, ask questions. We have a microphone here. Just please come down and we'll, uh, we'll uh, recognize you in a, a fairly short period of time. Um, some of our uh, uh, panelists have uh, referenced the importance of uh, being observant of the Constitution, being respectful of the Constitution as we try and get to the truth in this. Uh, but the Constitution um, is implicated in a, a lot that occurred from uh, Patriots Day forward. Uh, Peter, you talked about living in an open society. Uh, living in a free society. Um, but when we do a debrief of this incident, should we be prepared uh, to make concessions when we go to open events like the marathon or other events uh, that are for the public to enjoy, but since we know we're vulnerable and we're trying to enhance our resilience to these incidents, should we be prepared to make accommodations for the sake of prevention? Well, I think no matter what, we're gonna learn some things that from this incident that we might be able to take that are so sort of pragmatic to reduce the exposure of this uh, kind of violence. But we should take as a given that we are not gonna be able to prevent these very crude level attacks as a normal course of things by essentially a law enforcement or sort of a gates, guards, and guns kinds of approach. I mean, I think one of the interesting stories that really hasn't got much resonance is that despite the thousands of law enforcement moving through Watertown and the house-to-house -house effort to find um, the last, the second bomber, that it was when the removal of the request, I think I'm gonna call it here, to uh, shelter in place, the homeowner was the one who goes out and goes, the okay. tarp, plastic on my boat, that's not right. Let me go check it out. Now, he complied with the rule to stay in because he was being supportive, but the, actually the only intelligence of all this vast national security mm -hmm. law enforcement apparatus to find it was the homeowner who was observant enough to say, I didn't leave my boat like that. And apparently, they, there was law enforcement who went by and looked at the driveway and looked at the boat, but of course, they didn't know that, that very small change. We had the same thing happen with the Times Square bombing in 2010. Literally, an NYPD car sitting on the corner of Broadway directly across the street from where Faisal Jha drove his SUV up to, <coughs> and it was a t-shirt vendor to go, that ain't right. And so one element of this is not to look necessarily for the governmental kind of capacity, there is a level of citizen awareness now that we probably need to ratchet up a bit. And that's a really difficult thing to do. But that effort of basically saying at the end of the day, 
if you, if you want to have a free and open society where this risk is ongoing, you're not going to get there by essentially treating all of us as citizens as potential victims and leave it to law enforcement security to take care of. And, and, and the and very important thing about dealing with fear, fear fundamentally works when first you're aware of vulnerability. Okay, we say a child is fearless when they don't know they can put a hand on a hot stove, right? First you have to be aware of vulnerability. But really makes the panic sort of fear response that we have is when I feel powerless to deal with the vulnerability. The more we engage civil society in understanding risks, dealing with risks, recovering from risk, the less afraid we are. And therefore, the less likely we are to say, I want this trade-off of more security. I'll give up all my liberties to get it. Uh, I apologize. I called you Peter, not Stephen. Yeah, and I, and you know, he's in the back. Like uh, twins, uh, right around here, uh, uh, as co-directors, so we, we blur together. <laughs> Jack? No, no. I think uh, we got some questions. Oh, good. Oh, yeah. Please go ahead. Go right ahead. I actually wanted to start by making uh, a point through my own research and through my own studies at Northeastern. My name is Joshua Frank. I'm currently a political science major at Northeastern, uh, finalizing my dual major from t between political science and sociology. So that's my, I was my fourth year at school, actually, I just finished that up. Um, I wanted to touch on a point Professor Urbanovich made um, when she said, you know, let America continue to be an inclusive nation. And my point kind of is I don't feel like it is. I feel like America as a melting pot almost as it makes it so the United States has a lack of identity in terms of what does it mean to be an American citizen. Uh, the truth, you know, we're looking for things like truth, justice, capitalism, American pie, baseball. I mean, those aren't really, those are great foundations for, for a nation, obviously, but where's the meaning behind it? Um, so the truth is you have these people looking for little niches is where you find your identity. Uh, you know, you're white, black, race, obviously, religion. Um, when it comes to people who maybe don't have that identity, and they're struggling and they find meaning in radicalization. Okay. Anyway, um, so going back to Professor Flynn, I actually wanted to talk to something about, you know, we're talking about resilience. It's also an environmental word. Uh, resilience is the ability to respond to a problem. Uh, in this case, it's the same thing. So my question kind of is, do you think it's enough? Uh, I think personally we need some sort of sustainability when it comes to personal issues. You know, where's the empathy going to come from? How are we going to prevent people from wanting to do these things in the first place? Obviously, the need and the, the ability to respond to a problem is necessary, but how can we solve it in the first place? I mean, I, we certainly should aspire to mitigate the amount of folks who are drawn into this and, and, and understand what we may be doing as a society, how we react to this thing, which could fuel the very motivations. You know, this was clearly an element of the 9-11 response by taking a segment of our population, treating them all as potential bad people until mm -hmm. we sorted it out. Mm -hmm. Well, that alienation means that community is not likely to be as cooperative as you would like it to be in sharing their knowledge about somebody who is truly is being uh, dangerous. You know, so it actually undermines the goal. Uh, but, I, you know, this is a hard thing to say, but I'm afraid events last week, you just aren't going to get to zero on this realm, right? No, 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 it no. takes a tiny number of people who have access to, today, very destructive means that can be cooked, basically, by going on the internet and getting recipes and going to Walmart and get black fires and buying from Home Depot, the pressure taper, and, you know, mix in a few nails and you're off to the races. Mm -hmm. The idea that we're going to get to some point where we're getting that down to zero is quite low, which is why it's important to talk through an adult like way, just like we can't prevent every hurricane, we can't prevent, we can't prevent hurricanes, period, right? Yeah. We can't prevent earthquakes, we can't prevent all fires. So what do we do? We think about how we're gonna cope with it. And my concern is our post 9-11 reflex, because this is what we were told essentially, we're gonna get to zero basically risk. We're gonna take the battle to the enemy. We're gonna mm -hmm. win the war on terrorism. And your job, as citizens is to shop and travel and leave it for, you know, this national security apparatus on steroids to take care of this for you. Well, we're 12 almost years into it here, and how's that going? So the reality was we should have been talking at the outset that this is a fact of modern life. we got to deal with it like other facts of modern life that have risk. I mean, it is amazing. I was just talking yesterday to the Dallas No One's News reporter because little there was this unfolding. We had a fertilizer factory blow up, 12 people died, 
uh, most of those first responders, took out a community that still has no water because the water main's down, and it's not even a blip on our, mm -hmm. you know, kind of discussion right now. Mm -hmm. Well, so comparatively, damage, loss of life, higher. But guess what? We actually have quite a few fertilizer plants, and some of them can blow up, mm -hmm. and some of them can take out communities. And yet, that's a risk that we're not talking so much about. Mm -hmm. So this is risk. You know, it's not a particularly nice one, but we, we have risk, and we deal with it most of the time. Uh, another question. Sir, did you have a question? Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Steve Nathanson. I'm in the philosophy uh, and religion department. I'm a philosopher. And I've actually written some about, uh, probably more than one should, about the definition of terrorism, among other things. Um, but I guess the point I want to make about uh, terrorism and, and words, uh, I think that in my own uh, definition and account, terrorist attacks always have a, uh, a political aim and they're an attempt to get some people to do something by attacking innocent victims. And so this case is not so clear a case of terrorism, although one might say that the real uh, target was perhaps the United States rather than the innocent people who actually suffered death and loss of limb and so on. Uh, but I'm not sure that within our own society we want to be careful or everybody wants to be careful about words. One of the things that struck me recently is in the federal charges that this person is charged with uh, using weapons of mass destruction, which is a totally absurd notion. Weapons of mass destruction were initially applied to nuclear weapons, which we, by the way, have used. Uh, it then was extended to biological and chemical, which is not always appropriate. Uh, and now it's extended to pressure cookers. Uh, and this seems to me to indicate really that we should be troubled about the people who wrote that law in Congress because it's inflammatory language that has no serious uh, a use in terms of clarifying what's going on. The kind of discussion going on tonight is an attempt to clarify, but the words that we use are actually often words that are meant to inflame and actually to manipulate us. I was very glad, Mr. Flynn, that you just mentioned the West Texas explosion, a very serious uh, event that killed more people. I don't know what the number of injured is. But here we have events like this that are treated in a kind of ho-hum manner. We don't respond to the industries, the people who create these kinds of situations and know that they involve risks and don't take steps to change them. We don't criticize the regulators or the states who don't set well, up regulatory. I ask if we could either frame I'll, the question I'll or... A, I'll stop in a half a sec. So it, what's clear here is we're very selective and we're also very manipulated in terms of our responses to violence. And it's, it's often the, the way that the language uses, it, it's a form of incitement rather than a form of producing understanding. Any responses to that? Well, just with respect to the idea of what is a weapon of mass destruction, that'll, I think that'll be an interesting legal argument. Uh, there's a doctrine of, known as the void for vagueness doctrine, and I would anticipate that the federal defenders will say that the phrase is void for vagueness. It's so vague as to be meaningless as applied to this case. So that might be a legal issue here, potentially. Just a preamble to the next series. We want to be respectful of the, the need for people to, you know, to not only ask a question, but to um, you know, share to a certain extent, but we also want to be respectful that we have a limited amount of time and there, there are several people who, who want to ask questions. I'll try to be concise in my question and not make a statement. Um, I wanted to, um, um, I'm, my name's Brian Levine, I'm a student in the School of Law. Two of my past professors are on the panel. Um, I wanted to raise the issue that's been brought up in terms of, I've known a lot of people, including people I'm associated with on Facebook, politicians who've wanted them to be, um, the people who accused to be charged and tried or outside of our criminal justice system and as enemy combatants. And I don't believe they even meet the 
broad definitions that were established for that under um, in recent years, but I, I do find that kind of troubling and the concerns that our own criminal justice system can't handle it even though we've, we have prosecuted things like um, Oklahoma City, uh, which was prosecuted in the federal system, moved to Oklahoma, moved to, I believe, Denver. And are there, are we targeting people for prosecution um, in a, as an enemy combatant because of their race, their religion, their ethnic origin, and some of those implications? I'll, I'll take a, a stab at the first one. Um, Zokar uh, Sarniev may not be tried as an enemy combatant because he's a United States citizen. So that's off the books for at least this prosecution. Anybody else want to comment? I think, the other, I think that the discourse around it uh, has been that you get too many rights in the American criminal justice system, and outside of that system, you're more likely to get a conviction. And I think that's the really dangerous part, is that that's sort of a, the common sense sort of wisdom around it is that you, we give away too many rights to folks in our regular court system. So. Next question. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, I, I was just going to respond by saying I think it does, you know, it does again bring up some of the racial and religious issues, the enemy combatants conversation, because we wouldn't, we don't talk about enemy combatants for a lot of the other random acts of violence that we experience, you know, school shootings, I and mean, these are really tragic events, and our immediate a reaction is not to go to the enemy combatant conversation. So I think that's, again, where we see this kind of inflection. And I'll just add one thing, which is, you know, as a practical matter, you know, to sort of Daniel, Daniel's point about, uh, the, you know, the, the sort of red herring quality of the Miranda, I will put an NYP detective against anybody in the uh, agency, uh, CIA or, or other interrogators on the federal side. I mean, in terms of people who know how to ask questions and get answers, if that's what you're after, people who've done it for a living for 30 odd years, as some of those folks are, will do it. You don't do it all the time in the military. And, you know, and the kinds of skills that were being developed for these very intense interrogation techniques we see, you know, one went over a line. Secondly, the effectiveness has certainly not been demonstrated to mm -hmm. me. And yet, an experienced detective questioning a uh, suspect, they're pretty good at getting answers. Now, whether or not, again, they'll be admissible at That's the end of the day, but if yeah. you're doing an investigation, want to get answers, go to an NYP detective. They'll help you with getting answers, and they won't do it by beating them up. They just have a way of eliciting people to give information. And the importance of this discussion goes back to one of the points we probed earlier, which is, what's the intent? Yes. What was the intent, and did Zokar share the same intent as his brother uh, and we, that's something we may never know. And by the way, I didn't mean to, now I've been, I've been 10 years in New York, so I'm sure our Boston police detectives are just as good. <laughs> Please, go ahead. Hi, I'm Barb Buchanary, and uh, my question is this. Although it played out in a very benign manner, the shelter-in-place request, I'm curious uh, what your thoughts are on the um, greater ramifications of them having implemented that. Sure, this is one... Um, you know, following through, I was, I was early on talking about and applauding the, the resilience again of the area. I was just found it remarkable. I was in New York on 9-11 and it's after, in the immediate aftermath and it's, I share some stories about that. But the coming in on Tuesday morning down to Copley Square to do some interviews and when they first set this thing up, I was like, geez, I'm gonna have to put plenty of time to sort of find my way to get by through this closed area and all that. Well, the, the cab driver dropped me off on Dartmouth and Stewart and there was the crew in. Uh, Starbucks was giving out free coffee and people were milling around and I'm going, this is exactly how you should be dealing with this. You know, that, that, that we didn't know who it caused it. We had these explosions. We didn't know if there were more coming out here. But the response was, let's keep going. We got uncertainty, but we'll deal with it. Clearly what happened, you know, it's an unprecedented event, the way this thing, this was unfolding. And so I don't want to go back and say, how much, you know, we have, you're chasing a suspect, he's throwing explosives out the window at you, he's escaped, you know, a lot of uncertainty. And the general impulse, of course, is when there's a lot of risk out there, is if I can basically put a freeze on the situation, I simplify the situation, I have a better ability to potentially detect the problem I have and intercept it. 
And also I want to make sure because these folks demonstrated that they're willing to go after groups <coughs> of people r randomly and kill them uh, that well, let's give them less targets. But again, the irony of the shelter in place effort was that the ultimate tip came from a citizen who came out. Now I think the reaction I like about the way Boston handled it, for me, th what was probably the most challenging issue was when the governor decided we can't keep doing this. And I would argue he's probably in this impossible position because there was law enforcement probably telling him, okay, we haven't caught the guy, more bad things can happen, and so the governor, if this goes south, you're on your own. You know, we're, we're trying, and the, you know, as a political leader, you're in a really tough spot, right? You know you can't keep doing this, but there's still risk. And what's key here for, I think, our takeaway is we should have thought of that. We've been worried about this problem for a long time. We should think about the what is, plan for the what is, how to communicate. What was clear with the shutdown is we have the tools to throw a kill switch. We're really good at that. All right? I mean, when you want, you know, you, all of us got text and email and broadcast in the university. Big employers do it here. And we were all told, and we all, you know, complied as a sense of think of civic duty, not because we were afraid, but we complied to help out the situation. And we can do that. What turns out is we don't have very good tools to turn it back on again. Okay? And we don't have very good tools to be nuanced. All right? I mean, Watertown, that made sense. Boston, uh, you know, but uncertainty was there. But the challenge is once you've done it, and again, risk is still unbounded. I mean, the analogy, of course, I think we were operating from is thing like the blizzard, right? Good call the governor made when we had the blizzard come in here. Guess what? I'm going to close the roads down before things come through. It'll make it a hell of a lot easier to clear the roads afterwards because we wanted people stuck in it, and that worked out really well. Blizzards are great because they have a clean start and finish. Okay. okay. And terrorist events don't. Uh, so that's why it's a challenge. All right. Hi, Chris Matera, Northeastern alum, current staff member, and adjunct professor at Suffolk, teaching social media. Um, as has been mentioned multiple times tonight, there's sort of this double-edged sword with things that have changed with access through the internet. On the plus side, you have uh, the sense of resilience that was available on Twitter and Facebook and blog articles written by journalists that passed around very frequently and kind of got everyone excited to be Bostonian again. Uh, flip side, you have the fact that you can learn how to make a pressure cooker bomb. And terrorists can find, or extremists can find homes online with their groups of people as well. Um, through the course of the manhunt and everything else, I noticed things where up to one million people were listening to a Ustream channel on a scanner. This is access that didn't exist before. Yeah. And thinking about the law implications, you know, my biggest source through the manhunt was following BPD, following Watertown police, following federal investigators. The fact that supposedly there's a federal agent on Reddit observing and seeing what people are saying. What do you see as the implications of this new sense of technology and its impact on society on things like law and government and enforcement, and also possibly as evidence later on of looking at someone's, say, Twitter account? Daniel, that sounds like you. Uh, I can talk about the evidence. Why don't you talk about the evidence part, and then I'll talk to you about the other stuff. Great. Very briefly, in terms of evidence, um, there is an exception to the hearsay rule. You've probably heard about hearsay from either law school or more likely law and order on TV. But out-of-court statements that are offered for their truth, they're treated as hearsay, generally inadmissible. However, there's an exception in a criminal case when a party has made a statement. That statement may be used against the party. So anything on suspect number two's Twitter account, anything social media, anything he said, as long as there's not an issue of um, tying it to him, that it wasn't hacked into or something like that, authentication can be used against him and will come in. I think the, the key logic of the internet is that the internet doesn't respect boundaries. And so if we think about uh, the boundaries among, let's say in this case, the suspects and our communities, uh, you know, the, the people would have known, uh, had the, they would have had friends and so on, but wouldn't have been so transparent, right? I was reading on Facebook about the connections. I'm only two degrees separated uh, from one of the suspects. Um, the, uh, the fact that there is not 
as clean a boundary between the people who are controlling the investigation and citizens, right? That, that, uh, that citizens are sifting through the photos and discussing what might be relevant evidence for finding suspects. That also uh, is, is something that is blurring the boundaries between investigators and citizens, much, I think, sometimes to the discomfort of investigators. Uh, and, so, uh, and so I think that there's this blurring of the boundaries that, uh, that the internet is uh, spurring. Uh, pe people have spoken, uh, I think uh, Daniel spoke about some of the errors that occurred uh, with all of the internet and viral activity, but one thing to remember is that the Boston police were on top of this communication like nothing I've ever seen before. And when the false report of a suspect's arrest occurred, I think on Wednesday, they shut it down with a tweet. And there were over 10,000 people who sort of monitored that, they have, they have essentially shut down that rumor. So we're going to see an evolution of this technology that we can't even imagine today. We'll take two more questions, and then we'll wrap up. Hi, everyone. My name is Bianca. I'm a senior here, uh, graduating next Friday. Mm -hmm. Thanks. <laughs> Too, so we made it. Anyways, I just wanted to go back to the whole intent and culpability thing. And I'm not going to give you my whole thoughts on it, but I just feel like nobody's talked about the fact that this boy who's alive, who's in custody right now, is only 19. And how, first of all, how do you think it would be, it is going to be implicated, the fact that his older brother also was with him? And how do you think it would be different if his older brother was still alive? Jack, why don't you start? Right. I, I think that what you're raising is this whole issue, issue about culpability, and I think that what you're going to find is that, yes, let me say one thing. We're all operating from a set of facts, many of which will be proven to be false <laughs> over the next few weeks. And so we'll understand a lot more about what the culpability is, what the planning level was, what the relationship between the brothers were, if they were the only ones involved. I, I, I think that's a bit of a vacuum. But what you end up with is that it may not speak to, and you have lawyers that are better than me, that, but you may not speak to guilt, but it will speak to punishment. It'll speak to what kinds of punishment a person deserves if they're convicted because of their level of, of being involved in this, in this particular incident. And it may go back to the issue about the death penalty. Anybody else? Uh, if I may, just briefly. Um, Jack, I think you're exactly right. So there, if, this death, if this case does proceed as a death penalty case, there will be two phases. The guilt phase, where they will adjudicate guilt or innocence, and then the sentencing phase. So in the guilt phase, where I would see this coming up, is it's conceivable that the defense would raise what's called a duress defense, where suspect number two's lawyers would say that he was essentially coerced by his older brother, either psychologically or physically or both. And that is treated as an excuse in criminal law. So maybe that could be used in the guilt phase. Assuming that doesn't work and he is convicted, then as Jack points out, I could see these same arguments playing out again at the sentencing phase as part of the mitigation case by the defense, where the defense would bring in some experts who would say he was very young, just turned 19, um, 18 is the floor for applying the death penalty anyway, he wasn't necessarily acting on his own, he was under the influence of his brother, we should, he should, his life should be spared. That's how I could see it playing out in those two ways. Anybody else? Okay. Last question, sir. Thank you. Um, my name's Jonathan, and I'm a student at the law school. Um, one interesting quotation that I read with regards to this incident actually came from Al Jazeera, um, where a commentator for the newspaper wrote that this is evidence and the way that we've seen America react to things like this before, he worried that this would be the final thing to push America from only being able to tolerate Islam, but now never being able to accept Islam as part of what being an American could be. And certainly there are structural things that give validity to that point of view, such as Guantanamo Bay, um, where people have been sitting for, some of them for 10 years now, never seeing the inside of a courtroom. So I just wanted to ask to what extent um, does the system and does the way that um, Islamic um, 
people of Islamic faith are treated within the system, to what extent does that have to change so that we can move from people of the, to people of the Islamic faith feeling that they're just tolerated here, but not truly accepted and integrated into the fabric of American society and culture, to feeling like they are part of what it means to be an American, and that there's no difference in that regard. Um, well, I definitely cannot speak for all Muslims. Muslim <laughs> um, but, um, I mean, I think there's a lot of things going on right now. You know, there's what's happening in the media, there's a public portrayal of Muslims, there's the fact that, you know, I think everybody would like to think we've moved beyond 9-11, but immediately after the uh, bombing, you know, the first guy was a Saudi, then they accused a student at Brown who's been missing who is South Asian, then they went to two, uh, the two kids that were featured on the cover of the New York Post, both Arab, both afraid to leave their house, their father was afraid to leave their house. I mean, it was just a whole, you know, it's so, it's, it's I think it's, I don't know what's gonna have to happen, you know, to, to rebuild some of the, this, but I do think there's gonna have to be a lot of work on, you know, on all different sides, and communities are gonna have to come together, and there's gonna have to be a lot of that, and I think people are gonna have to resist. I think we're gonna have to start resisting the stereotypes. I think we're gonna have to resist the knee-jerk impulse to talk about Islam and Muslims in a certain way. Um, and I think we're gonna have to take some real, you know, real other steps too. You know, we can't have this double-sided relationship with Muslim communities where on one hand there's FBI informants and heavy duty surveillance and on the other side there's community building and you know, police community cooperation. That, it doesn't really work that way. I think we all know that. Um, so there's no real easy answer to that question, I think. I'd be interested in hearing what others say. Uh, well, I think this is a one of those situations when the whole community have to speak up. This is not up to the Muslim community. This is up to all of us. And I think that is a, really what I meant by the standards of American society, that we here do believe in justice for all and that we will be living to these expectations. We might not do that all the time. We may, you know, and, and certainly uh, uh, um, all the valid point that you made about lack of justice is something we live with. But remember, we have a civil rights movement here. People did fight for their rights and they get, get the, those rights and so, and you could not do it alone. You have to do it as a community. So we all have to be part of that. So we all have to speak up. And, and in that respect, that will not happen. I, I'd like to echo that. And, and just also point out, I mean, I think there is an important difference. Immigration reform was almost at a point of the cusp right before 9-11 and just went south. But we're hearing at least one thing is bipartisan. I mean, there's, there, there's the pull here, but Republican leadership has certainly come out and said, look, this should not derail the immigration reform. So, so that's a healthy sign, right? That People aren't just taking this one thing and pulling it off in another direction. But I just want to say this is where Boston can really make a contribution to the country. We, we have to, they're looking to us, how we respond. I mean, we're the ones who are attacked in this way. We're the ones who are dealing with the folks who are hurt and, and, and going to the funerals. How we respond to this community sends the right signal. And by participating in these kinds of conversations, but making it as a purpose that we're in Boston are gonna show our tolerance and our resilience and our compassion <clears throat> is a way that we can help reduce that risk. Thank you. Why don't we close on that note? Let me make just a, a very brief closing remark. Uh, first, let me thank our very thoughtful panel for their insights and reflections on this topic. Um, in the aftermath of the bombing, the president said that one of the things that makes America the greatest nation on earth, but also one of the things that makes Boston such a great city is that we welcome people from all around the world, people of every faith and every ethnicity from every corner of the globe. So as we continue to learn more about why and how this tragedy happened, let's make sure that we sustain that spirit. I think it's in that spirit that we had this conversation tonight and we'll continue to have other conversations going forward. Thank you again to our panel and thank you very much to the audience. <laughs>